Hello again, everybody. I'm Mark Madden, the man who ruined WCW, but enough about me. Joining me, as always, this time to read a text he got in the wake of a certain victory. He is the 16-time world champion. He's the nature boy, Ric Flair. Tell him, Nate. Woo! Blue. Go blue. I congratulated Mr. Harbaugh by saying congratulations. You are the man. He responded with, thanks, pal. Incredible ball team to be part of. Humble, fearless, never careless. Woo! Well, there you go. Michigan winners over Ohio State. Michigan now firmly in the national championship playoff picture. And to be fair to nature boy Ric Flair, like Bobby Heenan said, be fair to Flair. Rick did predict Michigan to beat Ohio State. Then again, he's been predicting it for the last 10 years. It had to happen sometime. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter when it happened. <laughs> no question. Better late than don't never. Think, they, don't, I don't think I did late a fine bomb, too. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people out there who regret you having their phone number. Rest, rest is short of that. Now, moving to the wrestling portion of the program, and congratulations to Michigan. What a great victory by them. But moving now to wrestling, and I want to stir in a little football, Tim, because I'm not sure who got beat up worse, the Pittsburgh Steelers or Seth Rollins. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. What, what, what about that? We all saw what happened on Monday night. A fan uh, bum-rushed Seth Rollins, took him down. Uh, Seth almost had a choke on him, but then it got broken up. What's your take on that? There was a time when that would have really severely hurt Rollins' reputation when people thought it was a shoot and you had to be tough right now, I'm not sure how much it matters. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And, uh, on all fairness, and I, I could say a lot of cute things, but I'm not going to, um, are you sure? Yeah, I, I, yeah, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to, every time I say something, I, I have to involve other people and then they, they have to endure the consequences. So I, I'm just going to say this. Um, I, I've seen that happen, but I've never seen it where the, 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 the we call the mark, the fan, you know, clearly was getting the better, get, clearly getting better the individual. But my, my problem with it, Seth, is that if you're a top guy in this business and you know anything about the psychology of what the fans think and feel, which they really do, you never, ever, ever get off an airplane in LA and say, I was terrified, terrified of what? Terrifying Seth is being in an airplane crash. You were terrified or horrified by a wrestling fan. Come on, man. What I would have done if I was Seth, which everybody should learn from this is that even if the referees had him, I'd have jumped back on him. Even if I never got a shot at him. I know your answer is going to be, well, there's lawsuits and all that. The WWE would have covered the lawsuit. Seth never would have got to him. But you, if you're a heel, you'll never admit defeat. You just don't do it. Do you think I ever beat anybody? No. But in the word, in the minds of most people, I didn't lose. Because I never lied. I kept lying about it. Even <laughs> though it was at work. <laughs> you, never, you never admit you got your ass kicked. Much less being horrified or terrified. Yeah, I, I agree. That was a bad look for Seth after the fact. It was and, a uh, bad look for TMZ. Christ. But uh, I got to tell you, uh, you, you have more stories than I do about fans jumping on wrestlers and getting the worst of it. But uh, what I want to share is from the late 90s on Nitro, during a match between Dean Malenko and Psychosis, yeah. a, fan hit the, a fan hit the ring. And uh, my friend growing up from just down the street in Pittsburgh, uh, Brian C. Hildebrand, who refereed yeah. for WCW as Mark Curtis, passed away uh, far too young from stomach cancer. Great guy, and I, I miss Brian horribly. But this fan hit the ring, and Brian kneed him in the head, then choked him out with the guillotine in like five seconds. Yeah. And he was five foot five, a buck forty. Rick, I know you remember that. That was amazing. And we called Brian the shooter after that. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, in the old days, especially, the referee was every bit of part of the action, you know. And things that I used to do, like have a referee hook the guy's arm so I could sneak in a punch or, you know, hit him in the eyes. That kind of stuff could get a referee killed back in the 70s. 
because they literally thought the referee did it. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I was telling them to do it. Um, and of course, we've all been, you know, jumped on by, by people in the rings. I mean, I can't tell you how many times me and Valentine had to fight our way out in the South. They were, they really, in the South, well, I think they really think wrestling, well, outside of maybe New York in the old days, because I heard they had riots outside the garden. But in the South, I have seen some unbelievable uh, attack by fans. Um, in Atlanta, we had a riot tonight that uh, the, the four horsemen with Ole turned on Dusty Rhodes. It took us an hour and a half to get out of Atlanta, out of the, out of the cage and out of the building. And this is the Omni. This is like in the 80s. So, you know, we've seen a lot of tough, a lot of tough situations that, but you can't ever let them think that they get, that, you, that you're afraid of them. But the minute they think you're afraid of them, then, then the situation gets out of control. So you just got to swing and hope for the best. Now, what's the what's the most lopsided wrestler on fan beating you ever saw? When a wrestler got jumped, who really took it to a fan that you witnessed? Because uh, I, I know some guys like Harley, you know, Bruiser Brody, you just, you know, you, you were in for a really hard time if you if you crossed them. Well, I've never seen anybody jump on, uh, on Harley. I've seen Harley invite people into the ring that thought they could beat him. <laughs> no good luck with that. And Brody... Brody just terrorized people. I mean, <laughs> first couple of times I wrestled him, and I thought to myself, man, this is going to be a long night. And it was, but that was a business back then. And when I started, you had to be tough. I certainly was never considered a tough guy, but I must have been fairly tough to survive the 70s because, you know, I've been hit harder. I, Jack Mulligan slapped me in 1978 so hard on a wrestling TV angle that broke my jaw and my eardrum. Okay. Um, you know, Michael Hayes one day, uh, <laughs> the business has just changed. You know, uh, Sean threw me in the ropes one time and I missed the top rope and I went in and I, I, I broke my nose, tore my lip open and I'm out on the floor and uh, with Kyoto rocked up and says, Hayes says, get back in the ring and get through this. I go, okay. Okay, Michael, I will. I'll figure it out. <laughs> By the way, where am I? So it's just, that's the way our business is. I mean, you got to be tough to be in this business, period. Even today, these kids are tough. I can tell you right now, and I I always, I can't help her bring her in. She can kick anybody's ass. <laughs> what, what, who asked? Who, yeah. Your daughter. My daughter, yeah. Second generation kids are taught to be tough. Roman, this, uh, Roman Reigns, um, the uh, the Uso, that's why I've, I'm such fans of, of kids that had to really be tough to just survive in life. And if you've been a real athlete and really competed at a top level, you're tough. You're mentally tough. You're physically tough. And, and, you, and you're, you're honed and trained to be. To, I mean, if that same thing had happened to Ashley or hypothetically, I don't know that the guy could have got taken Ashley down. <laughs> no, she's... She's tough, man. I mean, you know, you don't think Tamina's tough or Nia Jax or Natty Neihart? Are you kidding me? They come up in families where you had to be tough. Oh, Natty and Neihart I, got trained in the dungeon, so we yeah, all know how tough. Yeah, how but tough that's, she's got to be. I, but I can assure you that Tamina and Nia and people like that are in their Samoans are playing tough no matter where they're trained. Why do you think? Why do you think to this day we still talk about Haku? Why do oh. we still? Why, why, why do we still talk about Harley Race? I mean, the island guys have no fear. Well, legendary I mean, toughness, and and by all accounts, Haku was by far the toughest guy. Who, no, I, 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 you never know. I I, I love Haku because Haku was so damn big, but I'm still rolling with Harley Race. And don't ever take Dick Slater on the equation. I mean, let me tell you something. We're in Japan, and it's Dick Slater and Tenru against Bruiser Brody and Stan, who terrified and beat the crap out of the marks going to the ring out of every wrestler that ever got in the ring with him when dick slater was in there <laughs> no dice huh no dice nobody well, wanted H, H, no, did you ever no, see no, 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 nobody wanted to try slater and, yeah i mean it, it, you know i could give an example when promotions went up against each other like in knoxville with the barnett and fuller so they brought in bob roop I think Barnett did. Fuller brought in Dick Slater. Guess who? Guess who won that one? And Bob Roop was an Olympic wrestler. 
he he crawled out of the bar his hands and knees begging Slater to get off him. <laughs> now, Nate, did you ever see a fan pull a knife, pull a gun, anything like that? Oh, you... God, I was I was there the night Ole got stabbed. 106 stitches, and he worked the next day. Now, where did he get stabbed? I mean, on, on his in way the ab- to the ab- way? Ab- ab- no, first of all, he went up, he saw the guy, he was an older man, 60, I think like 65 years old. Ole went up to block to block the blade coming, right? It cut his wrist, and then he caught him, and he cut down a hole halfway through his chest. From his upper pectoral to his belly button, and they put only in jail for attempted murder. So only hit the, what's that? So the guy was sixty-five. He was an older guy. Yeah, maybe he went to high school with only. <laughs> no, but I'm saying that's the way it was back then. You would fight our way out of that Greenfield Memorial Auditorium, Columbus, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Are you kidding, man? It was a fight to get to the stage. Now, Nate, but, you know, uh, but but here's the problem: if we didn't get that kind of reaction, we were pissed because we wanted right, we, we, right. we wanted them like that. Now, Nate, uh, moving on, I want to talk about something that happened on AEW TV. There was an interview between uh, CM Punk and MJF, who who were both great on the mic, and I thought it was a great segment. Yeah. But CM Punk called MJF a less famous Miz. I don't get that. I don't get invoking a guy from the other show, especially when you came over from that show not too long ago, it kind of tells people that the other show is the real show. When you say their guy is better than our guy. I, I just didn't get the wisdom of that. Um, I don't know. I didn't think of it. I, I, I thought the segment was so damn good. I didn't really, I, I didn't track that part of it, you know, but you're right. You know, why, why ever bring up the other company? And, and, and I'm saying that on behalf of, of, of both companies and the wrestlers, that are WWE or, or AEW. Um, but I'm a big fan of uh, MGF. The kid can talk. And more than that, he carries himself like a pro. He dresses. You know, I, I can't emphasize enough how important in my estimation it is to look professional. And that kid always looks sharp. And that, and that's, I'll leave it like that. Oh, um, no question. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Max as well. I just again, you one one thing you would never have, Nate, and, and never have to my knowledge. You'd never hear a WWE guy mention an AEW guy on their TV. That just would not happen, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, I, I believe so. I'm sure. I mean, I mean they, they, Vince would number one. Vince would go crazy. Some people probably get fired for doing that. On, but they do it on social media, which for some reason is the criteria that is the do all end all for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sense? well, you're right. I mean, a lot of stuff is booked for social media, and I question the wisdom of that. Now, since Punk has been in AEW, and since Brian Danielson's been there for that matter, they've had some odd matchup. They've had some good ones too, but Punk the other night on TV wrestles QT Marshall. And no no knock on QT Marshall, but I remember when, when Punk and Danielson and Adam Cole came in, the Tony Khan said that was like when Hall and Nash – came to WCW. Well, I can tell you for certain that when Hall and Nash came to WCW, they didn't wrestle Glacier and Buddy Lee Parker. Uh, no, but they wrestled, uh, you and I talked about this yesterday, they wrestled Bagwell and Scotty Riggs, which meant nothing. But the day that Sting got involved, uh, Kevin and uh, and Scott Hall uh, were made. And, and going back to being tough guys, one of the last tough guys in the business that, that I that I that I can think of is is Scott as a uh, is Kevin Nash. You never you never saw anybody dick around with Kevin Nash. The Steiners didn't do anything with him. Nobody did. Kevin Nash is a tough kid too. Well, it's it's seven foot. I mean, a legit seven foot. And boy, well, I mean, did you see he posted a picture on Twitter the other day of him after a workout? Rick, he's still a monster. Oh, I know. It, it's Wait, just but, it's incredible the shape that well, Kev he, keeps he, himself he, in. Yeah, he, he's he, he's. Huge in the fitness, but don't here you have to remember, Mark. You can't measure a guy's height or his size if you're tough. It's in your heart, right? It's your. It's not how big you are. I can Mad Dog Rashawn could walk into any dressing room for both companies right now at five foot eight and two hundred and thirty pounds, and no one would say shit to him. <laughs> <laughs> don't trust me, Gagney, Gagney. I see you in the ring. You think you can beat me? Do it. 
<laughs> He's talking about Vern Gagne, right? So wait, this is Mad Dog. Gagne. He didn't call him Gagne. It was Gagne. If you think you can beat me, you take the title. <laughs> Nate, did you know that Kevin Nash once uh, not only blocked the Michael Jordan shot in college basketball, but pinned him to the backboard, pinned the ball on the backboard? I did not know that, but I'll be texting Kevin afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> now, that brings us to our, our regular segment, uh, friends and foes, uh, uh, guys you wrestled with and guys you wrestled against. The guy we're going to talk about as this week's friend was a very close friend of mine as well, uh, the late Brian Pillman, who was in the Four Horsemen with you. Yes. Certainly had a unique personality. And H, I want to start out by asking you your memories of him in the horseman, because I can tell you for sure that there was never a prouder moment in Brian's life than when he was in the four horsemen with Ric Flair. Yeah, well, the problem was Brian was, was just too good. And once again, the politics of the business, uh, they, they ended that. That was the shortest run, but he should have been there forever. Brian was a fabulous athlete. Again, I like to use the word legit. Um, you know, D D D1, Cincinnati Bengals, everything else. And then we're just a, a, a tough kid, but a really nice kid. But he became and caught on to wrestling so fast and got so good. But it was like going back to the night that that um, we turned on Sting and, and, and Sting gave me that hot tag. I, I had street clothes on and I came in and turned around. And nailed Sting, boom, boom, and Pillman and I and Arm beat the crap out of Sting. The next day, we get to Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, Eric has Sting beat me in the middle with his hold. Arm feeds in and puts the hold on Arm. And uh, I think I've told this before. I hope I didn't say it in the show. We did. We can take it out. But Sting goes back in the locker room and Sting's back. Eric Bigger was going. Sting's back. Not a word to me and Arm. Nothing. And of course, there was no angle. It was over. Well, uh, you mentioned Brian's uh, football background. Uh, the story I always like to tell about him: he was a five foot ten nose tackle at Miami yep. of Ohio, and yep. he made second team All American. You know who the first team uh, All American was? No, the Fridge, who was literally William Refrigerator Perry, oh, Clemson. literally, yeah. literally twice Brian's size. Wow. And, and boy, what a statement that made about Brian, right? Yeah, exactly. Like I said, a phenomenal athlete. Now, and, and, and a great, great person, too. Yeah, and, and like a maniac, which I say in the fondest way possible. I talked to him, you know, every day for years and often at three in the morning. He would call me at three in the morning oh. and I would say, I would say, Brian, it's three in the morning. He, I, why can't you call me at 8 a.m.? And he goes, well, uh, I'll be asleep then. Uh, yeah. I, I think of Brian. He called me, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was, he was just. Walk, he was, Nate, walk, Nate, walk. Take the belt, <laughs> walk, walk. <laughs> Not quite well, that simple. <laughs> what what might have been for Brian had it not been for the Humvee accident, which really cut him off at the knees in terms of working ability. I mean, he was still very good, but the problem with that was he didn't like just being very good, and I thought that really nobody 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 does did a lot of damage to him psychologically, and he was never the same after that. And and I hate to say that might have started him down the the, the path that, that that eventually he came to an end with, but uh, it was very sad. Yeah, it was. Um, I think anytime somebody's been at such an elite level, I mean, I go back to the Griffin kid. Um, is it Robert Griffin the third? Yeah, RG three, correct. RG three that came that suffered that injury, and uh, when they there was a, a, a I think it was just it was an argument as to whether he should have been put back in the game or not. I think Shanahan was the coach. And uh, he got hurt worse, and uh, you know it, 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 he just never it, he never came back from it. And yeah, uh, and once a guy like him loses his mobility, yes, you, you know what I mean. All his other skills paled by comparison. Exactly. And I think there was an element of that to Brian too, because yeah. you know the way he moved, he moved yeah. like a, a Division One All American. He just had that like a cat, like a right, cat. Right. He had anticipation that went way beyond wrestling. Yes. So, so I thought once he had to have, I think his ankle was fused. Yeah. Uh, that that took away a great part of his repertoire. Although I would always tell him, your psychology, your persona is still head and shoulders above almost everybody else. But uh, but he wanted to be that that big time worker in the ring. Yeah. Here here are two Brian stories. One you may not know, Nate, but one I know you remember. How about when he was doing the loose cannon 
and he grabbed Bobby Heenan on live TV and Bobby screamed out, what the fuck are you doing on live TV? And then walked <laughs> off. Total shoot, unbelievable. Yeah. I don't remember that, but I'm sure it happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was on a Clash of the Champions. I, 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 and, and Bobby legit had to be talked back on the air. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. Bobby had to be talking to manage me again a couple of times after a couple of nights on the road. <laughs> well, that was a that was a different kind of discussion. And and another story I've told this many times, but I'll keep it brief. I covered the Steelers and Cowboys Super Bowl in 1996, Super Bowl 30, for the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Yeah, and that was when Brian was a free agent, was trying to generate all kinds of of, of publicity and, and and awareness to try to drive up his contract. And he called me up and goes, "Listen, I got an idea." You give me your press pass to the Super Bowl, and I run onto the field and chain myself to the goalpost. Yeah, sure. it'll take it'll take them forever to get me out of there. It'll be all over the place. I'll get the biggest deal in wrestling history. Yeah, and I said, "Well, Brian, I think that's a great idea." I go, but then I couldn't cover the game. Yeah. I'd get fired from my job, and I would never work in journalism again. <laughs> and there's like there's like a 15 second pause, and Brian goes, "Listen." I can't be the only one making sacrifices. <laughs> yeah. That's not like, th th that was during a period of time when Brian was uh, under medication for the pain in his ankle. <laughs> well, I was just about under medication for, for something at that point, too. And it's funny, too, because uh, I left the Post-Gazette less than a year later. And had I known that, I'd have, I'd have given him the press pass. <laughs> uh, what 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 about Brian Jr. who wrestles in AEW? I, 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 I finally got to meet him. Yeah, what a nice kid. Yeah, I think he's a real talent, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about this in just a little bit. But I I think that roster is so overcrowded that that some guys who are great talents like him and his partner Griff Garrison in the Varsity mm -hmm. Blondes they just don't get enough exposure, and it's not anybody's fault. That's just how many people they have. But I still feel for the kid because I think he can be a star. Yeah, I do too. I mean, and. Uh... You know, regardless of how um, how it ended for Brian, I mean, the fact that people like you and I can reflect on the, all the good things he did, and that's one of the reasons that Brian's son will be able to, you know, I think more people are going to remember Brian as being a great worker and and, and a great talent rather than, but you know, the the, the stuff that the people would ever say negative about him. Which, which, oh, yeah. I, I don't think anybody speaks negative of, of uh, Brian now. I, I just... No, I, I meant I meant to how he passed away and all that. Oh, yeah, but the, but the loose cannon stuff. Like, some of the stuff, the crazy stuff he did, like in ECW, that brief yeah. stopover. I mean, that's where I'm glad about YouTube because Brian Pillman will live forever on YouTube. Some of the stuff he did just hey, to, to, to this and, day. And, and that, you just made a very valuable point because I think someone a couple of weeks ago insinuated that I had to use them to get a rub, um, I won't bring up her name, but um, <laughs> she better turn on YouTube <laughs> or go into the library. <laughs> oh, there's plenty of Ric Flair, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, no, 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 it's, <laughs> there's more than plenty. I got 14 cameos on my phone to make today, and all they want to hear me say is limousine riding, jet flying, kiss, stealing, wheeling, dealing. They don't want to hear nothing else. So nothing I did after that, will ever be forgotten, it'll never be replaced. So I don't need a rub from anybody, miss, whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story that gave me a rub that involves Brian before we move on. Brian was in the act with a uh, WWE female personality and he called me on the phone and did play by play. <laughs> in the act, and I, I've said who it was before, I, I I won't right now. Don't do it now. The but But I will. It's but a, I will a, say, he even talked her into doing a little bit of color commentary at one point. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was just hey, delightful. I'm not talking. I don't. I don't have comments on this part of the show. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take hey, over. Hey. H, it's, it's the Ric Flair podcast, but I'm going to take over every so often, please. <laughs> you have to. I'm not allowed to, to make comments and that kind of stuff. Now uh, we. So Brian Pillman was our friend for the week. Uh, a foe. And, and this is great following on the heels of talking about Ronnie Garvin last week. Yeah. The foe is Wahoo McDaniel, uh, who you had some great matches with early in your career in Mid-Atlantic. How about that picture with you, Wahoo, and, and Bob Cottle? And there's yeah. Wahoo, a very typical Wahoo pose with a belt and yeah. some blood. Who chopped yeah. harder, Wahoo or Ronnie Garvin? Oh, uh, Wahoo. 
260 pounds. I mean, he would beat the living crap out of me. You know, I'll, 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 I got a pacemaker now, and I'm not sure that I should have ever had any, the reason I have no blockage, because I've had to have that, that where I've been catheterized, right? To have that, um, to look at my, my, the arteries and everything in my heart is because Garvin and Wahoo <laughs> hit me so hard for so many years, I could never accumulate any, uh, uh, any blockage he knocked it right out yeah, they certainly did i told you with garvin same thing with wow i put a tube of neosporin on my on my chest every morning and a tube every night <laughs> because you know back then you know, the rings weren't like they're there now they weren't uh you know i've, I've seen guys get staffed by just falling on their knee in a dirty ring you know so i was very lucky but Make no mistake, I think Ronnie Garman's a great guy, but Wahoo was a double tough son of a bitch boy. I mean, bad to the bone. Well, Wahoo had that pro football player credibility. No, no, too. No, by the way, no, nobody tried Wahoo either. <laughs> I'm not putting him in a Harley race category, but I don't remember anybody ever trying him. Well, Wahoo was a, a real good uh, player hey, in the American I'll, football I'll, league. I'll, let me tell you a great story about Wahoo. So when when Valentine and I were partners. <laughs> We used to all make TV and crack up promotions on a uh, on a Tuesday morning. We do all the taping for the various markets and the independents and or the uh, different TV stations. So we're there for about three hours. And one day, <laughs> one day, Greg was talking about. Well, he said, "I'm going to take that dumb fat Indian and you know da 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 da." And Wahoo was sitting in the bleachers. And walked over and punched out Danny Rowe in the mouth. It, it'll never be fat Indian, by the way, kid. <laughs> same same thing with Blackjack and and uh, Ole Anderson. Ole said something smart about the very and and, and, and Ole is still hiding in the bathroom in Norfolk. <laughs> Now, uh, as, as I said, Wahoo Jack, played... Hey, Jack, Jack Mulligan, double tough, too. Trust me. Hey, now, the greatest hey, the greatest story about Mulligan is he's, he was smoking us. Oh, we were in Marietta, and Luke, Lex Luger, and Mulligan was, you know, was, was an agent for the company at that time. And, and Luger walked up to him and said, why would a Lex Luger wrestle a Dutch Mantel? You know, talking about himself in the third person. <laughs> Mulligan, who I thought was just going to slap his shit out of him, <laughs> put his cigarette on the ground in the, in the locker room, stepped on it, and walked out the door and never came back. <laughs> that that third person shit didn't get over the old timers. Why would they? I don't know, because you were told to. <laughs> and I'm not going to lose my patience and kill you. I'll just quit. <laughs> Now, Wahoo played for the New York Titans in the AFL, who yes. later became the Jets. And uh, I don't know if you knew this, Rick, but he had a unique uh, – oh, played for the Broncos, too, apparently. Uh, he had a unique uh, thing about his uniform. When he played for New York, he had Wahoo on the back of his jersey. I think yeah. he's the only guy And every ever time had. he made a tackle, the crowd would say, guess who, Wahoo. And that's why, to give you some history, because I'm so much older than you – when they drafted Joe Namath, they traded Wahoo because they only wanted See? one star. And I'm a professional sports writer. I did not even know that. So well done. Yeah, absolutely. They traded Wahoo. Look, you can look up the dates. They traded him a day after they drafted Namath. And, and this is which Wahoo is having lunch with Mickey Mantle downtown drinking all day. <laughs> I mean, Wahoo was a big celebrity wherever he went. He was a bigger than life person. You know, a scratch golfer in fish hunt. Chase women, whatever he did, he was intense. <laughs> you know what I once, you know what I once said on the WCW. Hey, Wahoo was married six times. He's he's two ahead of me, man. <laughs> no, he's one ahead of you. Let's let's count two, two, Oh yeah, but I mean, he he ended up six and oh, or oh and six. I'm still I'm still tied in there. <laughs> You're one and four. You, you you lead Wahoo and very few others. Now, uh, uh, you, you know a, a quick story. On the, on the late and oft-lamented WCW hotline, kids, get your parents' permission before calling, I once said, in a desperation maneuver, Mickey Mantle's doctors are going to have him and Gene Okerlund switch livers. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Hey, I was with Mean Gene drinking, and he was yellow. 
And all of a sudden, he got the phone call. And there was a car wreck in Cincinnati, and they flew the kidney to Dr. Nigerian at the University of Minnesota. Gene got on a plane, got the kidney replacement, back at TV in, I would say, five weeks. And we were at the bar that night. <laughs> Eric Bischoff called me when I said that about Gene and Mickey Mantle. He said, I don't know whether to fire you or give you a raise. <laughs> so- well, <laughs> Mickey Mantle, I, it's, it's funny because I, I, I heard the story the reason Mickey drank so much is because uh, I, I think all his brothers and father, all his his, his they, brother. They all, and his, his, his father died young. That's correct. His father died and, young of and, cancer. And a brother, too. And an uncle as well. Oh, an uncle, so okay. he, he assumed he was going to go young. That's yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I walked into Wahoo's house in Charlotte and. Uh, he had a big picture, like you know, like almost like a like a mural sized picture, maybe eight by ten, of him, Lee Trevino, Charlie Pride, and uh, Mickey Mantle, all with a with a driver in her hand, touching the drivers, at a, on a on a on a golf course. Now, pretty, uh, pretty heavy company. By the way, quick quote: Len Dawson, the great Hall of Fame quarterback, once said, "The hardest hit he ever took was from Wahoo McDaniel." So it wasn't just in wrestling, Nate. It was on the the football field as well. And as far as Wahoo as a wrestler goes, for the time, he had a classic look, didn't he? As a a Native American and totally believable. As much credibility as I remember as anybody had back then. Absolutely. I mean, oh God, he was a world-class athlete. I don't know to this day, up until at least five years ago, he still had the longest punt in the history of the Orange Bowl when he played at Oklahoma. He played for Bud when they were like, I think then they have 31 straight wins or something like that with Bud Wilkinson. Um, but um, yeah, just a world-class athlete, but tough. And he, he, he you know, the, what happened with Wahoo is he just, he, he said, one, he just wouldn't work out anymore. I said, I said, chief, you need to go to the gym. Boy, I've been going to the gym for 35 years. I'm not going to the gym. I'm going to the golf course. <laughs> okay. Okay. Chief. <laughs> Well, he, he was, he was never world champion. And, and I understand, especially in that era, there were very few who got to be world champion. There was, you know, a, a panel for the NWA, the, all the promoters. But what do you think kept Wahoo from, from you know, uh, getting the world title? Because he stood up for himself. And not that Jack Briscoe and Terry and Dory didn't, but he was such a, Wahoo was a rebel. Uh, does it make sense? It, it, it was certainly wasn't because of his work ethic or his skill. It's just you had to be in that fold back then. I mean, it was the Funks and the Geigles and the Von Erichs and uh, Barnett and uh, Carlos Colon. And the only reason I ever got in there, got in that position, is because Jimmy Crockett finally said, who, who had never had any voice, his father did. But like they, I thought they think that they thought that when his father died, who I never had the pleasure of meeting. He died a week before I started in the Carolinas. That Jimmy would 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 we would just go ah, and roll over. No, he he got George Scott. They brought in Wahoo. They got Jardine. They got Valentine. They brought in a crew, and they went from being a tag team territory to us where they were featuring the single stars. And then Jimmy started getting in so big that he finally had a voice, and he said, "Boys, hey." You're going to give Flair a try, or, or, or we're going to, or you know, it's. It, it, I can. I never said this to a lot of people, but it was going to be me or DBS. And I can assure you, if we ever have Ted, who's a good friend of, of both of ours, on this show, when DBS didn't get the title, he went to New York. If he'd had the choice, I can tell you right now, knowing Ted DBS, he would have rather been the NWA champion and would have never left and gone to New York and been the million dollar man. But it was, it, it was hard. And then, and then of course, it, it, then after you get it, you wonder why the hell you want it when you don't go home for six, seven months at a time. And not, and not every town in Chicago, Greensboro, Atlanta, Miami. I mean, I hate to keep going back to Kansas, but <laughs> that week in the Kansas territory, I, I, I said I was going to Russia for the week. Well, what made them pick you over Teddy? I mean, did you ever hear the reasoning? Who supported you? Who supported Teddy? How did that happen? I think the difference was that I went to Puerto Rico a lot for uh, for Cologne, Carlos. And Carlos had a vote. 
I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll give you an example of a conversation. Ricky, my boy, this is a Jim Barnett. Ricky, my boy, I see you have my a boy. day off, huh? My boy. Yeah, my boy. I see you have a day off on in on January. I think you're off Christmas Day. I don't know how that happened, but Carlos would like you uh, for Three Kings Day, which is Christmas Day in, in uh, Puerto Rico. And I went, I went, it's my only day off. He said, Ricky, you know, Carlos has a very, he has a vote. He's very influential with the, with the, uh, with the boys. <laughs> so what do I do? Go home um, and get an argument about all the stuff that I've been doing, <laughs> which I haven't been doing because it was already knew about it then. The only I knew about it. Um, it was always suspicion, but <laughs> Or go to Puerto Rico and lay in the sun for two days. So, <laughs> well, not a hard choice, and maybe it got you the world championship. Up. It, it probably did. I mean, I, I just couldn't. Barnett can tell. It would always tell me it. They have a vote. You don't want to piss off the funks. You don't want to piss off Bob Geiger. I know you don't like to go in there, but I'm sorry. There was only 200 people there, and you have. You, if you asked you. If they want you to wrestle an hour with Bob Brown and Rufus Jones, you have to do it. Okay. <laughs> now, however, look. however, try that. I wrestled Bob Brown one time. The ring didn't show up. We put down a high school wrestling mat in front of about 130 people for an hour. I'm I, I'm I'm sorry. That's not on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Before- hey, I, I would I would pay someone to take it off YouTube. It was so bad. Now, before we move on from Wahoo, uh, how great was the Mid-Atlantic Territory in, in the late '70s through the mid '80s when it when it went national with Jim Crockett Promotions? Uh, That's I, a great when, picture when, of the Chief there. When Roddy was there, you, uh, I mean, just so many great steamboat. I mean, the Jake lineup Robert, was unbelievable. And Jake, like you said, Jake Roberts, the Briscoes, Dick Slater, everybody. And like you said, that 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 transformed the promotion. I mean, you were a big part of that. But it was a group effort, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was part of it. But I, to this day, I'm, I'm lucky to be part of these things. I mean, you look at you look at the guys that were there. I, I look at the lineup. You had the Briscoes, Jack and Jerry, right? Because Jack was no longer the champion at that time. I think it was Terry or, or Harley. But um, then you got Jake Roberts, Dick Slater, um, Piper, myself, Greg Valentine. Um, Paul Jones, uh, Rufus R. Jones. I mean, we, uh, so much depth. And then a couple of years later, we had the road wearers. I mean, the you know, to this day, I'll say it, if Jimmy had just stayed east of the Mississippi, they, they possibly still could be in business. Yeah, I think so, too. I think he just went a bit too far. And, yeah, that, that, and, and that, he, that, took, he took his battle to some cities where he just wasn't going to win, well, no matter the, what. Well, the... the, the, the the product was good enough, but not enough people saw it on TV because the penetration or the, or the, uh, what's the word they use now? It, it, there was not enough saturation of TBS on the West Coast. Right, right, right. TBS. Yeah, we, sold was... out, we sold out the first time we went, but if you can't see the show, the first time out of curiosity, even though they had a great show, but we started out as an example in a forum. 16,000, 14,000, 12,000, 10,000, like that, because no matter how good the product was, if you can't see it on TV, um, you know, what are you going to do? Now, uh, I want to move on to uh, just a, a situation. I'd like to see how you would handle it. Uh, guys are leaving WWE, not all the time, but there's some contracts coming up, like Bray Wyatt's already out of contract. Uh, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn will be out of contract soon. A kid from NXT. Johnny Gargano is going to be out of contract. And, and those are obviously all talented guys. Mm-hmm. But does AEW need more talent, Nate? I mean, that's already a, a pretty saturated roster when you only have three hours of TV. How would you handle that situation? I most definitely would hire Bray Wyatt. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of his. The kid can work and talk. And he comes up with some incredible ideas. I know you're not crazy about those gimmicks. But when you think that he put the time and effort and that, that those were his his thought process, plus um, he's legit, he's a tough kid, he was an amateur wrestler, played football at Troy. I mean, you know, I know I, I probably am 
in too much favor of, of a lot of the athletes that were, you know, play D1 sports and that. But I'm just a big fan of his. I, I like his brother a lot, too. Who You couldn't find a handsomer, more athletic guy. Um, but I, I, I think if I'm going to hire one more guy, I hire Bray Wyatt. See, here, here's my thing about Bray Wyatt. And I did not like the Fiend character. I thought that mm. damaged everybody a touch, except for Randy Orton, who, yeah. is, as we know, is foolproof. I loved Bray in the original gimmick with the Wyatt family. I thought that was that, brilliant. That, 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 I'm making more reference to that than I am the Fiend. Yeah, I, I thought that was brilliant. But, Nate, I just don't see where you put him. I mean, like, I look at AEW. They have 24 female wrestlers under contract, mm -hmm. and they only do one female match per show. I mean, no one can become a star doing that except Britt Baker, who's already a star. Mm -hmm. On their Friday show, they have four announcers, four people on mic at the same time. It sounds like a traffic jam. And, and they're all decent announcers. But, I mean, you know, where do you draw the line? Where do you feature the talent that should be featured? And when do you say no to somebody? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I don't want to be in that position of criticizing anybody. No, no, I, I know what you mean. And I'm not no, criticizing I, 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 per se. No, 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 no. I, I know what I would do and I would, I would make changes, but I don't own the company and I'm not, and I, I've, I've got friends there and I, you know, I, I have my thoughts about it, but uh, you know, everything again, everything, no matter where, where would we go with this show and whatever we talk about, Everything bears a result and a number called a rating. Right. So until the ratings start getting where everybody wants to be and they have a level of comfort with, then everybody's going to be under criticism and everybody's going to be looked at in a different light. Well, it's not even so much criticism, Nate, not on your part and not even on mine, although that certainly is my bent as a, as a cynical person, but... But AEW on Wednesday night is the only wrestling TV show I watch from beginning to end every week. The others I, I tape, I fast forward, I look for Ashley's match, I look for Orton's match, I look for AJ's match. Yeah. But I watch Dynamite all the way through. But the weird thing about the AEW fan base, and indeed the wrestling quote-unquote media that covers them, yeah. is unless you give them 100% approval, you're seen as an enemy of the state. And I give them like 85% approval, which you know, is, is pretty good, but, but I just, I just see some things that I would do different. I mean, I think that's natural. It's no different than what we, when we talk about football, Mark, you know? Well, that's not, yeah. the Steelers got killed. No, no, no. I'm saying, but everybody, you know, I, it's I, really hard for me because my daughter is arguably the greatest. I'm just saying wrestler of the last 15 years, period, man or woman. So, Every time I make a statement, you know, that it would in indicate any type of uh, criticism of either product, it, it falls on her. So I don't want to do that. No, no, I, 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 no, all I can say, is, and you know this too, numbers, they, I mean, everybody's going to have to find a level of comfort. And I don't think, I will say this, which I, I found strange, and I don't know, I don't know anything about it, so I can't comment. The last guy I would have fired if I were Vince would have been Bray Wyatt. So there must be something there that I'm missing. Because nope. uh, you can't, I'm not saying The Fiend was the greatest gimmick in the world, but as you said, Randy Orton, because of his greatness, made it work. So rather than criticize The Fiend, because trust me, Bray Wyatt can work. Oh, no question. So, ra rather than me criticize the character of The Fiend, how about the other guys for not being able to keep up with it? Uh, Does that makes sense. There's definitely an element of truth in that. And again, I'm not criticizing Bray Wyatt at all. No, no, I know you're just, not. We're talking about his character. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, not, not even that. I think he's great. He could work for me any day, but maybe not yeah. if I already had 20 pounds of sugar in a 10 pound bag. Yeah, but this that, guy is that's six my foot point. three. This guy is six foot three and 300 pounds. Most of those guys over there are much smaller than that. No question. You, no, if, I think when, he's, you, when you can find an agile athlete that can move around like that, um, and at that size, I, to me, he's a must hire. Now, speaking of, of big men, uh, Undertaker's been doing a few interviews out of character, which, you know, indicates to me he's not going to work again. But I don't know. Do you think he'll be tempted or is The Undertaker really done? Oh, I think he's really done. What makes you say yeah. that? Um, 
I just think, I just, the, I, I don't think Mark makes decisions on the spur of the moment. He doesn't need the money, obviously. He's been so successful. And I think he is so wrapped up with Michelle and the kids and his family and just live, he's in a, he's in a perfect, perfect scenario for what he wants to do. He likes being involved in the promotional stuff as does Steve, you know, and going back to what I said last week, it goes to show you the star power that these guys bring. When they're, when, when you could, when they're sending Steve Austin to Dallas and the Undertaker to Dallas to promote WrestleMania, trust me, everybody else on the roster is having a hard time keeping up with them. Does that make sense? Oh, no question. And uh... it's, it's not, it's not because they're on the road busy. It's just that having the Undertaker on a radio show right now is a lot bigger than having Seth Rollins on a radio show. And having Steve Austin on a radio show, it, 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 I mean, you, you know, it's just, it, 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 you just can't replace that, those two legendary characters in terms of doing PR for you. And, and you can't replace the star power either. Absolutely. Which, which brings up something that, that I've often felt about WWE, which is ever since John Cena, I think John Cena is the last true super duper crossover star they've had, or maybe will ever had among, among the men. And the reason that is, I don't think they want a wrestler to be bigger than their brand. I think they just want the brand to speak for itself. And certainly there's pros and cons to that. But but do you think that's the way they look at it? <clears throat> I don't know, because I think that they, um, and I, I do feel comfortable saying it, I think Roman Reigns is, 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 a, is the biggest star right now in the company and could be a crossover, do whatever we want to do. Uh, but I'm going to say this and attach this. If they gave Charlotte the push they give Roman Reigns, which I'm surprised they don't do because they women play such a fact, such a huge factor in the success of the promotion, that they would have the two biggest crossover stars and that would make a huge difference. Does that make sense? Oh, no, no, no question about that. But, but, yeah. uh, but uh, I don't think they're going to do that with any, any former name, but, but staying with The Undertaker. I thought one thing that was great about him for all those years, he never broke character in an era where, where everything was so exposed by the internet and the dirt sheets and later on social media undertaker never broke character. And I think for him to not do that, but also to be the one guy who didn't do that. I thought that made him even bigger. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, I, we were all watching the last dance in the last ride at the same time. And I found the last, the last uh, ride with uh, the Undertaker equally as compelling as the last dance with Michael Jordan, and 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 it's because I know all the characters for both. I know Michael, I know Rodman, I knew all those guys. They all came and hung out at parties I've had in Charlotte and that before when Michael was, was down there with the with the Bulls in town and Rodman and Pippen and all those guys. I've also lived in and you know had the opportunity to and the good fortune of wrestling Mark and being part with him socially and having fun. He just, he just, a, he's a unique individual and he deserves everything that he has in life. He's paid the price. He worked hard. He's worked injured. You know, we all have, but I mean, it, it's, I mean, I, I, I can't say enough good about Mark. We're going to talk about undertaker in future shows, obviously, but uh, a real quick answer to this. Is he the greatest gimmick performer of all time? I don't want to damn with faint praise, but but when I think of him, I, I don't think anybody ever did a gimmick and played it better and had more success with it. What do you think? Absolutely. Uh, but he may, be, he may be one of the t- 10 best workers of all time. Well, he's, he might not, be. Not, 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 not just gimmick. He might, and, and certainly in the top five big men of all time. I yes, mean, exactly right. Probably and top I, three. I, 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 and I'm going back to Don Leo Jonathan and all these guys over the years, guys that I've worked with. I'm talking about Brody is a big guy and all that. And Mark is a big, rugged, tough kid too. The, another kid that doesn't take any shit from anybody. So that puts him in a league by himself as well. Well, it's time for our other weekly segment, and we're going to add more of these. And by the way, we're going to start taking some questions from fans in weeks to come. So uh, follow Woo! Rick and I. Follow Rick and I on social media, and, and we'll up with some answers. But we well, rate the wrestlers. What, we uh, what? What? I'm, I'm at board right here. I've got 30 women calling, wanting to ask a question. Do I? Do I just push and go? Well, well, you, you 
It's whatever you like, <laughs> brother. What do you, you want to know, baby? Woo! Whatever you think, <laughs> do some good now. But wrestlers every week, we're going to pretty much get to everybody sooner or later. But I know you're real high on. Child has deserved better for his his Dolph. What's your take on Dolph Ziggler and has underutilized? Oh my God, my Dolph is uh, my take on Dolph Ziggler is that they if that market jumped on him instead of Seth Rollins. That, that market they would be that mark would have been stretched out, tied up, brought to the ring. He would have great fired him, stretched him, made him submit three times before he got back to the dressing room. <laughs> Dolph is a tough kid. Six. But what about ranked, should he have gotten nationally. better? Should he be in a bigger star? Yeah, but yeah, I, I definitely feel that way. But I'll tell you what he's done. He's taken every role they've given him and made it successful. And at the end of the day, he's had a 20-year career, made lots of money, saved his money on top of the world, and doesn't give a shit. They, they call him to do something. He doesn't. You know why? Because he knows he's better than they give him credit for. Nobody, nobody, I mean, once again, he's another example of a guy that is, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm touching the word great when he, when he wants to be. Does that make sense? If he has a partner, um, I, like I thought he and Seth Rollins a couple years ago had some like great matches. Um, but don't make it, don't think that Dolph can't, you know, yank a guy around if he wants to, but he, He's happy. That's the most important thing. He goes home happy at night. He's not stressed out about it because he knows how good he is. And that's what we all struggled with for so long in our careers. We know how good we were, but, you know, and the promoter, but it, with the minute you start getting social media and people going like this and then people going on a Hannibal, the, the guy that does all the interviews and knocking everybody and they would have done this and all that, I mean, then you have to endure that. If you're great, you're going to endure a bunch of crap. In Dolph's case, you never hear anything. He's the Tom Brady, not the GOAT, but he's one of those guys that it rises above being criticized for anything except being a really good, good professional wrestler. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan as well. And you're, you're absolutely and, and right. He's, and he's the last great American gigolo. Woo! <laughs> well, you're right about uh, something I want to reemphasize. And I know uh, some guys in the business, heck, in any business, my business, that are like this. You know, they might not get what they want, but they make the absolute best of what they're given. Exactly. And I think that Dolph definitely Dolph. comes under that heading. And I think he's an immensely skilled performer. And I think it's important to look back at the end of any career, any profession, and just feel like you did the best with what you got. And I think he can, he can do that. Now, I want to move on to Bobby Lashley who's having a pretty good run in WWE. And he's a bit like Drew McIntyre, who we discussed last week. He went to Impact Wrestling. And I don't want to say he he learned what to do, but kind of remade himself and refined himself. It was an even better performer when he came back to WWE. Oh, I think so. I think Bobby's done a tremendous job. And I, I you know, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, MVP too. And I like, you know, I like the fact they get dressed up. To me, you can never dress up enough if you're a professional. You never see Vince walking around in sweatpants and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Well, um, I'm, and, right now I'm wearing an Hawaiian but, shirt and shorts, so maybe you've come to the wrong but, but, place, but, but, I, but, you, but I get but your not, drift. But you're not in the workplace where everybody sees you. I'll be wearing you know? this in the workplace later, but but you're making me feel worse every second, H. No, no, I'm just talking about him. He he doesn't – that's what I, I've always loved about Vince. He doesn't ask you anything more of you than he asks of himself. And well, that, keep, go ahead. Well, keep, let's let's stay with Bobby Lashley because again, you put no, up Bobby, a good I think point. Bob, I think Bobby's very talented. I think he's a much better performer than he was the first time he was here. And and obviously, is is the experience helped him out a lot. Talk about that that connection that uh, with with MVP because I think that has done Bobby a lot of good. I think I don't think there's many better talkers than than MVP could work when when the opportunity comes up. I think that's been a a real good partnership. Uh, absolutely. I think I'm a big fan of MVP. I was, you know, he did a favor for me when I was on my way out. And then when I was, my self-confidence was horrible. He was there right there for me as with Steven Regal and some other guys. I mean, just, 
I can't, I, I, I just have a lot of respect for MVP on, and I, I do enjoy watching those guys work. You know, like, I like Sheldon Benjamin a lot too. Um, you know, there aren't, there aren't too many better athletes really in, in, anywhere than, than Sheldon Benjamin. I got news for you in case you haven't followed his amateur career. Nate, so we've been talking about Bobby Lashley. We threw McIntyre last week. And as we agree, they both kind of, I don't want to say got their act together, but they improved in impact and came back to WWE and have been bigger and better. Do we estimate impact as a promotion formally? Uh, there's more good stuff than we know. I have a couple performers now I love in Ace Austin and Alexander, who I think are, are due. I'm forever going to be WWE or AEW, but, but hesitate to call them a breeding ground because that, but maybe that's what they are. Well, they very well could be. I, I don't watch the show, so I can't, I can't comment on that, but all I can tell well, you right, is but that, you know who's come from there. Exactly. All I can say is that the, um, anytime you have a chance to wrestle different people, experience different situations in the ring, you're going to get better. And, uh, walking away and leaving, uh, as Drew and Bobby did and, and going somewhere else. I think, I think Bobby did some MMA, MMA stuff as well, but at the end of the day, if you want to be a big star, you come back to the WWE and they both did. And they, they both have done very well. And I, like I said, I'm a big fan of Drew and a big friend of Bob, a big fan of Bobby and MVP. Now we're going to talk about Cesaro next, who is this great mm -hmm. technical wrestler. Uh, I, I kind of liked him. You know, it's weird. It's a long time ago and Nate, I'm sure you didn't see this, but I loved him in ring of honor as one half of the Kings of wrestling tag team. I don't know. I mean, like, he is a very dry performer, but he's technically so excellent. What's your take on him? Uh, well, my take on him is that he and Seth Rollins had a match at WrestleMania <clears throat> that was difficult for anybody to follow. Um, so, I mean, I once again, I, I'm, I'm real partial to, to Cesaro. I think <clears throat> he said to me one time five years ago or four years ago, they, they don't think I have enough personality to be on the show. I said, you don't ever have to open your mouth. When you can work like you do, they're never going to let you go. <laughs> so, you no, know, I, I, they, I they, agree they, with they, that. He, he's the kind of guy I'd like to be managing and, and have him as a heel because he can do some really incredible stuff and he's a big, strong guy. He's probably the strongest pound for pound guy in the company. Now, why do they not do that anymore, Nate? Because it used to be so automatic. If a guy could really work and had a good look, which Cesaro does, but, you know, wasn't necessarily bubbling over with charisma, they put a manager with them, and, and that was that. That used to be so automatic, and now it so rarely happens. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would have I, – I, 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 like I said, I'd love to have that opportunity, but not – obviously, I'm not going to go back there, but um, – I, I think he's just an incredibly good guy. Um, and he does some, um, you know, the, uh, anytime you could do something that nobody else can do that separates you from the crowd, you, you're going to be in that position where you're in a position where you um, are going to catch your promoter's eye. And no, and no matter how hard they may have wanted to, to dismiss Cesaro, he'll always be able to come back because he can do stuff other guys can't do. And that's, what separates them, you know, that's like going back to my daughter. She can do stuff that other girls can't do. She can do a lot of stuff other girls can't do. And uh, and, and that's how you separate yourself from the pack. It, it's very simple. People, people can, they can be as mad as you want. They, they can say, ah, da, 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 da. But when they look at you and they're forced to look at you long enough, they're going to finally, they're going to throw their hands up and they go, hey, shit, I give up. You're right. She is the greatest. He's the greatest. Does that make sense to you? No, absolutely. It, and it, I think it, it, it's the fickle people on social media. I mean, <laughs> and, it, it, and it's an unfair judgment. You know, well, Rick, I, I think that applied to your career to a degree, too. I, I think there were promoters and, and times where whoever ran the company wanted to move past you. Yeah, exactly. And it was certainly attempted enough, but they just couldn't do it because you were still Ric Flair. And I think there's a handful of people in today's business that applies to as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
But going back to what you said 15 minutes ago, they're never going to be able to go past Undertaker, never going to be able to go past Steve Austin. <laughs> now, and, uh, for, and, want... and, and, and to a lot of people's dismay, I'm 20 years older than them, they're never going to be able to go past me. <laughs> I, I think we're proving that even as we speak. No, now, not, not, not Austin Undertaker, but a lot of other people who, in their delusional mind, think they can. And, now, and I that, wanna... and that, no, let me just say something. And that's very simply because of this. If for no other reason, people will always know someone like me only because they've had to watch 45 years, or no, 48 years of me on TV. If you're... You're going to be recognizable. You're going to be <laughs> swarmed with people because 48 years you've been jammed down their throats. You know, my, and people my will God, try that, and say, uh, beg pardon? That means you started when I was 12. I know. <laughs> it'll be, hey, it'll, hey, I've got to live to be to September of 2022, it'll be 50 years. Amazing. What Amazing. a party. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a party for myself if nobody comes. I'll come. I came to the last one. <laughs> of course you will. <laughs> now, uh, I want to move on to a couple AEW performers to, to wrap this up. First off, a, a guy who just moved over from NXT, Adam Cole. Yeah. It's so small, but he's so good. Yeah, I, I think he's gotten over better than, uh, than um, CM Punk or Daniel Bryan. Oh, I, I do too. And they got to turn him baby face because that's the kind of response he gets. I think they're kind of in the process of doing that now. Yeah, I, I wouldn't turn him. I, I would fight the other way. He, he, he's, a, he's a good heel. Yeah, but you always you want everybody to be heel because you never wanted to turn no, him. No, but, but when you find a handsome heel that can work and tell you that I'm better looking than you and I'm better than you, I, I, I stick with that guy. See, you're, you're saying, the, once again, what the fans are forcing us, the fans should never force the promotion to turn a guy whatever they want, or a, a woman, or a man. Now, I mean, why, it, why do you say that? What should the barometer be? The barometer should be what let them do what they're best at. And if they're really good, as he has been as a heel, for instance, you know what I mean? It, it, it's the tweeners that get lost. And once That's you true. Start, and once you start changing that formula around, the tweeners get lost. They finally have made Ashley a heel. After five or what seven years of being on top, six years of being on top, she finally is a heel. And they're finally getting it. And you ride, you ride with the big players. Look at Roman now. They need to ride Roman for another two years like this. Why wouldn't you? Now, how do fans get past Adam Cole's size? Because when I watch him, I forget he's small, because again, he's so good. But, uh, you know, I'd rather he be the he, exception he, he, than the he, rule. He doesn't work small. No, you're right. He doesn't work small. So the fans are past the side already. He works big. As long as he stays tight and solid, smacks guys, and out talks them. It, 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 you know, sometimes I, we all can get caught up on that size matter. They told me I wasn't. Here's how I feel about that word. Pat O'Connor, a legendary wrestler of year, told the NW I wasn't big enough to be the world champion. I said, Pat, fuck you. <laughs> and I, I and trust, I had to wrestle Pat a couple of times for an hour in St. Louis. That was not a night off. <laughs> he let me know all night long that he could end it. And he was 20 years older than me. <laughs> uh, well, that, that begs the question. Can Adam Cole be a world champ? Do you see that in his future? Uh, well, Daniel Bryan was a world champion. That's all I can answer that. You don't sound enthusiastic, though. No, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that, but I just know he has a lot of talent. And, and as I said, it, it's just my opinion, but of the three guys that went together, you know, it's really hard for three guys to all get over. If I'm watching the show, the guys, I think I'm mean, very entertained by, by Punk's interviews and the stuff with MJF and that, but... I, 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 when Adam Cole's in that ring, to me, I, 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 I like watching him. I did, I like watching NXT when he was there. Well, I agree that Adam Cole has got the best response. Hey, he's, he's, a, he's as handsome as Shawn Michaels. You know what I mean? He's got that kind of look and he's arrogant like Shawn. What more? 
Well, Sean, 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 Sean was not six foot five and two eighty. Oh no, 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 and and I think Cole can be a world champion, and I agree with you when you say that uh, he's gotten a better response there than even Punk and Danielson. Certainly a more consistent response. It's not yes. predicated on where the show's at, like Punk in Chicago and so forth. Thank you. But uh, but with Adam Cole, uh, I think a big part of that is he's not overexposed. I think. You know, Danielson and Punk are both in their 40s. Adam Cole's in his 20s or maybe early 30s. I'm not sure. And he's somebody that they haven't seen for years and years and years doing the same thing, which mm -hmm. is why I thought it was good to turn Danielson because that's something we haven't seen for a long time. But but again, I keep coming back to youth and energy and guys people haven't seen before, seen yes. as much of before. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, another guy to talk about that came over from WWE is uh, the former Rusev, now known as Miro yeah. in AEW. What's your take on him, Nate? Love that kid. I told him, there's no way in hell he's ever getting his hands on me. <laughs> 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 no, I love the kid. He's a big, strong, impressive guy, limber. He's got a million-dollar look. He's even lost more weight now. I'm really impressed by him. I didn't like the way they brought him in. I think it's his first match was in a tag match or something. I, well, yeah, they but, brought him in with Kip Sabian as part yeah. of Kip Sabian's wedding. He was the best man. And I didn't think they could have brought him in worse. But this new the, gimmick he has the, is the, the Redeemer. New, the, the new one. It's fantastic. tremendous. Yes, I yeah. love it. Yep, it's tremendous. And yeah, he, can that, work, he can work too, can he? Yes, he sure as hell can. He's a, he's a working fool. See, I see him as a world champ someday. And oh, I, I do too. Absolutely. I don't think he's an old guy by any means. So... No, and, and it, it just goes to prove that it, everybody thought, well, you take, it's kind of like it was when, when, when Liz left Randy, there was a clearly different a, a dynamic with just Randy by himself. But, and everybody said with Rusev without Lana, but he's proved everybody wrong. I mean, Lana is lovely and beautiful, but he can make it without Lana being there. And he's done a hell of a job of it. And his, his ability is going to continue in his momentum, you know, it's endless for him. And, and he's a great talent. Now, uh, I agree with all of that. So, and this is no knock on Lana, who I think is, is beautiful and a great performer. I would not bring her in with Miro. I, I think that's been discussed in AEW, but I just don't see the need. I think to make that kind of change, there would have to be a need. And maybe you do it later on, but not now. I, I totally agree. Now, uh, Did, I want to oh, move. Oh, not, not, not because I don't enjoy Lana. Well, I, right. I, what you, uh, I love that gimmick when they first started it, but I, I just think right now that in any kind of change would it would distract, it would distract from his, what, from his, um, I mean, just from the fact he's growing into be such a great star. Miro and Lana in WWE, when they were Rusev and Lana, yes. they had a real. Uh, Savage and Elizabeth vibe to them, didn't they? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. It was, it was great. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's perfect. You know, who knows why it went, went south? I've heard different stories, but um, <clears throat> I, I just, I mean, once again, we're talking about Rusev. I think, I think he's fabulous. And he can, he, the the things that um, the future holds for him are are, are limitless. And finally, he's currently sidelined, uh, but former AEW champ, former WWE star, Mox, John Moxley. Yes. Uh, who, who I think, uh, he's had his ups and downs, but I think he's a great performer, and I think he's real. I think he has a real connection to the fans. I don't think there's much BS about him. No, I, the fans feel it, too. He's fantastic. They absolutely feel it. What was your take on the Shield when they had him and Rollins and Roman Reigns together? That was kind of a good jumping off point for all three, wasn't it? Well, I'm sorry, say it again. When they had all three together in the Shield. Oh uh, God, I love that. It. Was a, that was a great jumping off point for all three, wasn't yeah, it? It benefited yeah. all of them. What a way to come in! Benefited uh, all of them, and they all got, they all made money. They all drew money. Most important word being, they drew money. Because a lot of people are making money that don't deserve it, but those guys drew money. And they had great chemistry, and uh, all three of them have gone on to have, uh, obviously, great singles careers. How tough is it when there's a group? Because uh, you were in, you know, many groups, uh, in, 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 in all the different promotions. How tough is it when there's a group for 
some of the performers not to be in the shadow of the others? I think that the guys that are smart enough know how to distinguish themselves. Um, you certainly, you want to make sure you divide the interview time. Um, I think there's always going to be one voice that's going to be louder or yeller than that, but, but everybody's got to have their own style. Everyone's got to have their thoughts in, 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 with the, 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 that they're comfortable saying. An interview means nothing if you're reading something that, that's been handed to you and you're not feeling it in your heart. It's dead. It's dead before it comes out of your mouth. You've got to feel comfortable with what you're saying. That's why people say to me, who wrote this interview for you? Nobody wrote them. I thought about them five minutes before I walked out on camera because I was pissed off because someone was better than mine. I wanted to make mine better than theirs. You know, we, we compete, you compete on a microphone and as much as you compete in the ring, or we did at one time. Well, I think when you look at AEW's interviews right now, they are so much better than WWE's because WWE's are clearly memorized. They're clearly scripted. Uh, you, you do see some interviews, Nate, where what you just said is very apparent that the, the, uh, the performer's heart isn't in what's being said. Whereas in AEW, I know they get bullet points, but, but they're speaking from the heart and they're speaking what they mean. I, I'd have to agree. Yep, I'd have to agree with that. You, did they ever but, try but, to... But, but just summarizing whichever company it is, if the, if the person that is trying to tell somebody an opponent or talk to the audience, trying to convince them of something that they don't believe in, that they don't feel comfortable with, it's very, very difficult to get it across. Did anybody ever try to script your interviews? Did, did anybody ever hand you something and say, hey, read this? Because I can't imagine that, but but did it happen? Oh, absolutely. The last five years I was at WWE, the last seven years. Ed Cosby. Ed Cosby used to walk me to the curtain and say, please don't say anything. It's not on the sheet. Please, we'll both be fired. So, so, you, I, so you would work off a script then? Because it didn't seem like that. But, but you know, I, I always ad lib, but I'll tell you, I just sometimes, and especially because I was having you know, self-confidence issues then, they hand you something. And because there are so many bullet points, which I, which I didn't have to do when I was young, I didn't have to, I, I just, the one bullet point I got in was the 18 to 28, no boyfriends, no husbands at the Marriott. That's the only bullet point I went in every interview with, right? Um, <laughs> boy, it worked too. <laughs> but, oh, I was no. at the Marriott more than once. Yeah, I know it no, did. No, no, but to be able to, to get all these bullet points, the name of the pay-per-view, the city it's in, then talk about your opponent. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. And even with someone as much experience as me, I didn't think, I, I may have had a couple of good interviews when I was there, but you know, I left my interview days behind in the WCW because yes, mine were all scripted. And, you know, and even if I made a suggestion, sometimes it would go like, Vince would say to me one time, 80s heels don't draw. Don't bring that shit up again. <laughs> well, I, so 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 just to reiterate. Hey, hey there's no win that argument either. Oh, 80s, 80s heels don't draw. <laughs> well, when you were an 80s heel and did some of your greatest interviews, like, you know, the I'm having a hard time keeping these alligators down. And, S-R-O every night. <laughs> and, 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 and born with the golden spoon. Just to make sure everyone knows, those were all basically ad-libbed, correct? Absolutely. And I was wearing everything I had on. <laughs> That's true. You could just go over your wardrobe. <laughs> Which I spent way too much money on. <laughs> Nate, uh, this has been great. Another fantastic no, episode. No, we're not done shooting yet. We will. We will. Trust well, me. When I are we going to shoot? We're going to shoot on Michigan right now. Can Michigan win the national championship? You beat Ohio State. Can Michigan win the national championship? They're playing Iowa this weekend, correct? Uh, that's the Big Ten championship game. I believe so, yes. In, in, in Indy, right? I believe that's correct. Yeah, they'll beat Iowa by 20. By 20? Yeah. And I'm going to tell you right now, those two defensive linemen on Michigan, I'm not going to say they're as, as good as that kid that plays nose tackle for Georgia, but those guys were outstanding. And if they play like that and get a pass rush on anybody, uh, like Georgia, Alabama, anybody, Michigan, 
is certainly going to be in there and, and well deserved. Can Michigan beat Georgia? Hey, hey, hey! And a and a and a and a from a program that's never been questioned for anything. Oh, no, no doubt about that. And Harbaugh uh, comes under that that category as well. But can they beat Georgia if it comes to that? I just said if they get a pass rush like those two guys and that that running back, if they play like they play, they can beat anybody. You know that. Does it, Cincinnati it just, deserve to be in the playoff? Oh, oh I, I said the beat. I don't want to get into. The guy okay, I'll get the, I'll the, I'll get into it. Uh, I think if you look at their record, they deserve it. But I look at the the creme de la creme of college football, and I know there's no way they can beat them. Although they did beat Notre Dame earlier this year, but I'm not sure that's a great Notre Dame team either. Well, you're not going to tell me that Notre Dame is the creme de la creme. That's what I mean. No, they're not. Not this year. <laughs> they haven't been since Eric Parsegian was there, for the Christ's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your final four? Who's your final four? Michigan, Georgia, Alabama. And I'm, I'm going to say Cincinnati because I think that at some point in time, they got to give them a shot at the title. Does that make sense? You know what? What, 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 no, what, what you're saying right now is what you're talking about wrestling. You're saying don't let the little guy in. Get, let the little guy have a chance. Well, here's what I would do. I would put Cincinnati in the semifinal against Georgia. And then when Cincinnati gets beat by 40, I would never invite – a group of five team to the final four again. Yeah. Okay. I would give them their one chance and then that's it. Hey, fair enough. I can't. See, now, Nate, Nate, now you're, you're, now you're in my territory. You're in mainstream <laughs> sports talk and I take no prisoners. Woo. <laughs> Woo. Until we meet again. That Woo-hoo. is, Rick, that is Ric Flair. I am Mark Madden. Thank you for checking out Woo Nation Uncensored. Ha, ha, ha.